so we're gonna do the show Stay Tuned brings together here. local experts, journalists, civic leaders, and regular people to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Add your voice to our conversation, and you're at the table. As we stay on top of current events and go deeper, bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. From the Nine Network of Public Media in Grand Center, this is Stay Tuned. Welcome to a special Stay Tuned this week. We're spending the whole half hour with our guest, Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for being here with us in the public media commons outside. Nice to be outside. Hari is the senior correspondent for the PBS NewsHour and also the anchor of PBS NewsHour Weekend Edition. Yeah. In St. Louis for what you see behind me, which is the Pioneer Spirit Awards. Thanks for being with us. We have a lot to, we'd like to talk to you about uh, from the state of journalism to current politics okay. in the U.S. But I want to talk uh, just a little bit about you, if you don't mind. I'd like sure. to get to know you just a little bit. Uh, your career track has varied. You've, yeah. you've been at the local level. You've been on the commercial side. Yeah. You've now on the public media side. Did you always want to be a reporter, Hari? You know, I think I did. Uh, when I first immigrated to the country, uh, Peter Jennings gave us the news every night. And by us, I mean my family and I. My mom and dad's English wasn't perhaps as good as mine at the time. So I would literally spend the time translating the news for them. I mean, that was the sort of first exposure I had to news. I probably had no idea, and that was I was eight or nine years old. Um, but once I got into high school, I started doing radio, and I had fun with it. It was basically a license to play music really loud in a soundproof room for three hours. Like, who could, who could find a better gig than that? And then eventually my uh, interest started to shift to news a little bit more as I got into college because I, I found that there was so much potential of what stories need to be told and who are the storytellers that do that. And if you're not at the table, uh, at the morning meeting, so to speak, at the beginning of whether it's a newspaper or it's a television station, then you don't get to help make that decision. So it, I just started grinding out internships in the Seattle area, and then I started working in a small market, and it's just been progressing from there. But I think I knew that I probably was not going to be a very good accountant or you know, any kind of job that kept me in a box every day at the same place. I inherently have, I'm, I'm sure I probably have some level of attention deficit disorder or something, I mean, which I think most reporters have it. And I just, this is the best job if you want a license to stay curious. And I can't imagine doing something more fulfilling than going out and getting to talk to whether it's a, a leader of industry or a politician or, uh, you know, a homeless person or just a general citizen. And then you also get to have very cool life experiences. You get to go places and be places when sort of history is happening. Who, a you know, what else could you do? A lot of access, it seems like, and not necessarily to the red carpet or behind the rope, but just yeah. access to a lot of different walks of life. Yeah, and I mean, it's, 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 you know, we all have a tendency to report when you go home and if somebody asks you, how was your day, honey? You're probably not gonna give them the chronological breakdown minute by minute. You're gonna pick an interesting thing or a horrible thing that might have happened on your way to work. You're gonna pick something that one of your coworkers said or did. Maybe you're gonna tell them about a place that you went. And you've essentially formed what we'd call a package. You gave them three sound bites. You gave them a couple of emotions. Well, we're just doing the same thing. We just happen to have cameras and microphones and we get to go talk to strangers and we get to come back and tell our friends why this is interesting. So why did you make the switch? Because you've you reached the national network level for CBS and ABC, very successful on the commercial side. What drew you to the public side? You know, it was kind of out of the blue. I, I had watched uh, the News Hour uh, or the McNeil Lair Hour for a while, the News Hour with Jim Lair. I mean, I just didn't, I didn't think in a million years, oh, well, I'm, I'm not old enough, I'm not, you know, I, I don't, you know, the people that were working there had been there 20 years, 30 years, I'm like, well, they're, they're not interested in me, and so my kind of a roundabout way, uh, this opportunity arose, and I was like, okay, wait a minute, let's, let's, let's look at 
what my life has become. And at the last place I was at on the commercial side at CBS, I was the Dallas correspondent, which is the sort of where Dan Rather started and a lot of other people did. Uh, Scott Pelley, I think, did a stint there. Um, it was, I was just going from one hurricane to the next. It was almost formulaic in my head. You know, if, if there's another hurricane season, and it's been a while since we've had one, uh, an active one, but I'll tell you the formula, and everybody's seen the formula. The day before the hurricane, it's the people boarding up their shops, and they're putting jugs of water in the shopping cart, and they're getting ready for this thing. The day of the hurricane, it's some guy like me standing in the rain telling you it's raining. And then the day after, it's uh, we go to the home of someone who's just coming back to see that their home is destroyed. And almost in a cliche manner, they'll say, well, the stuff we can replace, we're happy to have each other. Lift, two weeks later, different location, same set of stories. And it got to a point where, I mean, I have empathy and compassion for the people that are living through this, but I was saying, you know, I'm not really challenging myself to tell different kinds of stories. Or to give more context, because you could put that formula on a lot of different That's topics. That's right. Right. And public media is one of the last places where the audience has the patience, and so do the programs, to let someone finish their thought. Right. So if, for example, on the news hour, we have often people who disagree vehemently sitting right next to each other, but they do it agreeably. And they do it about matters that matter night after night, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's US politics, um, you know, about decisions that are facing our country. And I think that it helps inform our viewers. When this week we just had a five part series on rethinking college, and I do this usually once a year. And it's uh, an opportunity to look at how higher education is changing. And again, I have friends and I love some of my uh, old friends that are still working in commercial media, but they don't have the luxury of time. All my pieces start at the six, seven minute ballpark. If you wanted to get a six minute story on World News Tonight on ABC or the Evening News at CBS, that's a mini doc. You know, that's just, that's not gonna happen. So the luxury of time is something public media allows for because I think we also know that our audience is generally far um, more intelligent, affluent, influential, but I mean, I also like to remember that our audience, I think, is they're comfortable with cognitive dissonance. They're comfortable with hearing an idea that is other than their own. Because a lot right now, I mean, what really works for two cable companies is to have sort of affirmation bias or a confirmation of your beliefs. If you watch MS or Fox, you're going to hear a lot of a specific point of view. But that's not the type of viewer that necessarily comes to the news hour because they're going to hear something that perhaps might challenge their worldview, but they're okay with it. They're willing to listen to it. And that's a pretty rare uh, and smart individual these days. So that's who I'm talking to, and I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Where are you finding your audience? Where do you want to find your audience? Because you've taken on some unique uh, kind of pushing the envelope in your role at the news hour with social media and other things. And GoPro on the helmet at yeah, the convention yeah, yeah. and whatnot. So where is this audience and how do you reach them? So I think that there's uh, different segments of the audience. There's a traditional broadcast audience that are similar in age and demographics to who watch the evening news. Uh, and then I'm, I'm trying to think of what are the next generations and how are they consuming news? I mean, even at our age, it's hard to find people in just the way that their lives are scheduled who can rush back home and watch a six o'clock newscast. And I get that. Now, I'm very happy for the people who have the time and make that commitment to watch us at that point. But you see, just look at the technological leap that DVR or digital video recording DVRs alone, TiVo boxes have had on us. Just the ability for us to time shift. There are people who are traditional evening news broadcasters or, or news viewers who are happy to press pause, get up, go to the you know, kitchen, get themselves a sandwich, come back and press play, right? So the technological changes, we can't be sort of completely oblivious to them. And so time shifting is one of them, and these devices are another. And so I know that there's still an opportunity for me to reach members of my generation and beyond if I can figure out how to get my stories in front of them where they are when they are. And that's a challenge. And that's not something that traditional journalists of 40 years ago had to think about. 
you know, write it and it will be read, mm -hmm. broadcast it and it will be seen. Do you have more flexibility to figure that out on the public side because you're yeah. not as concerned about the, the dollars that come with the eyeballs on the broadcast itself? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, we're inherently different from uh, the commercial folks in the sense that they're in an audience business, right? If you looked at, I mean, a shareholder of Disney that owns ABC um, has to be thinking about profit at the end of the day and how much money is uh, ABC willing to spend on news creation. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not saying that they're not, but I'm saying that somewhere in the equation is, this is costing us too much. We don't have enough advertisements to support it. And for us, I think the equation is different. I mean, it certainly costs a lot to create content, even though quite a few people think that content should be free and news should be free. It's not, it, it costs us time and energy, regardless of what kind of newsroom you're in. Right? But people have been accustomed to, oh, well, I should be able to get that for free. Well, on the public media side, we're saying, well, who are our funders? You know, who stands by us? Uh, how are we anchors in the community? And in places like this where you have a sense of community, it's much easier because people open up not just their wallets, but there's sort of uh, deep links between the, the small businesses in this community that support Nine Network, right? So um, that's... You know, it, it's still a struggle to make ends meet, but when you have a group of people behind you that are actually willing to stand with you, that actually shields you from the sort of ups and downs of corporate uh, commitments. Um, I don't think that, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, uh, the, the, I don't think your show, I, I know that the news hour doesn't worry about, did we do this story and did that upset an advertiser? That's not our business, right? If we'll, we'll kind of go where the story leads us and um, and if it's going to you know, be in diametric opposition to a company, we make sure we run it by our legal team and say, let's dot the I's, let's cross the T's, is the story solid? Get it right. Yeah, and go on the air. Last time uh, you and I talked, it was just after the election. I'm trying to pull up a, a Twitter uh, question here. And, and then we were talking about data and the role that data played. I'm, oh, wow, that was a while ago. It yeah. was a while ago. So shifting gears here now, Let's go back to, you're talking about Twitter, we're talking about people, how you're engaging. Here's a question. Uh, what else stood out most to you about this election? Does it make you hopeful or not? That's from Hannah uh, on Twitter. Uh, are you hopeful or not? Because sometimes, my gosh, deplorable might be the nicest word that yeah. people on either side would yeah. use, uh, especially if you're looking at the comments section, for instance. You know, I don't, I guess it's not about who wins the White House that would determine whether I'm hopeful or not on November 9th. Um, the thing that concerns slash saddens me most is how much uh, people here take the act of voting for granted, right? There are a lot of people who sort of brazenly say, I'm sitting this one out. I really can't stand this person or that person. And I kind of you know, want to say back to them, do you realize how many countries on earth don't have this opportunity? especially if you're in a you know, battleground state, so to speak. Um, and e even if it's not in a presidential election, if, even if it's the local election in an off year, um, in fact, there's probably a lot more influence and impact that you have on the local school board bond measure, the levy that's passing or not, because there might only be a few hundred people that show up. I mean... Uh, it might be a bit dictatorial of me, but I think that voting should be mandatory. I mean, I can't, uh, let's just say I, I want you to go get the sticker at the polling booth as long as you're physically able to. You don't have to vote. Your choice can be to abstain. But I think it's an incredibly small price to pay at least once every four years to participate in what is still arguably the greatest democracy on the planet. You mentioned immigrating with, you, with your parents as a child. Does that inform that opinion somewhat, give you a better appreciation? Yeah, I mean, I, I came from the biggest democracy in the world to the oldest, right? So um, it's, it's really something that I, you know, there, it's, a, it's a parliamentary system there, and they have gridlock in different ways as well. But I'm always amazed by the fact that more than a billion people wake up in India every day, and somehow they identify themselves as Indians, even though, like, imagine, if you will, people in St. Louis looking completely different than the people in Oregon, speaking a totally different language, praying to a different God, eating different foods, right? 
and still waking up and saying, I'm an American. Well, that's what happens in India on a daily basis, that we have so many different languages, so many physically different types of people, um, and yet there's something that binds them together, and there's a sense of togetherness and connectedness, and, um, and I think we have that in the United States as well. I think in cycles like this, which seem incredibly divided and polarized, we seem to forget um, that we actually helped people figure out that patriotism. It seems like we're splitting into two different camps more and more every yeah. day. Is that hard as a journalist um, to walk that line and to give equal time and to, to dot all those I's that you were talking about before, especially when one candidate says things that in a previous election yeah. you know, would have been uh, headline news multiple times a day that would have carried the news cycle for fair, several days previously? Yeah, I think that uh, there isn't a, a, a sort of this abstract notion of objectivity, and I think what we should strive for more often than not is just fairness. And it's not about equal time, and it's not trying to make sure that there's a negative light cast on both candidates or a positive one. I think you cover what's being, uh, you know, what, what, what's out there in the ether. But what's also been very difficult for this, the the, the media in this cycle, is to uh, is is almost a a recognition that they're being played at their own game. Um, you know, that essentially if you tweet at 11.30 at night or midnight, you know that the morning shows are going to pick it up and talk about it, and you essentially could win another cycle. So is the, the media day. not kept, are we not smart enough? Did we not, did we get it outplayed on this cycle? We've got some, a learning curve to catch yeah, up to? Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's definitely, it's fair to say that. I mean, and I think shows like the News Hour have a totally different kind of luxury, and that we don't necessarily have to say that that is the driving force of the day. It's because we're not, we're, we're still focused on one program in the afternoon or the evening, and while we publish online, we're not in as much of the horse race mode as uh, a lot of commercial media and certainly cable media are. There are new polls that come out every day, and that's not necessarily the story for us. You know, there, there are a lot of other stories um, we did uh, on this weekend's broadcast that we focused on education, partly because it was American Graduate Week, but also because we think it's important. Uh, we focused on what was happening in Syria because that is consequential. Um, it, and to sit there on the day-to-day -day for too long uh, is actually a disservice to our viewer because that kind of gets back into this very myopic, let's focus only on this little horse race and forget about the rest of the world. Um, I think if we can help people see more of what's going on in the world, we actually empower them as smarter American citizens. We mentioned the big data you were talking about in 2012. You're kind of a tech guy. Is there something on your radar this election cycle that's uh, having an impact technology-wise? You know, uh, I think that there, the, the candidates and the campaigns are much better at using social media they're much better at using Facebook, for example, to target you. And I think, I want to say six months ago or so, Facebook had said something about allowing campaigns to merge their voter rolls with the user data, which I thought was kind of mind-boggling, um, given that most campaigns have a fairly good psychographic profile of who you are. Facebook has a much, much better one and a much more specific one depending on how much you use it. It can tell you, it can tell advertisers whether it's uh, Procter & Gamble or it's a uh, campaign. I can, you know, I can target by what sort of operating system you use, whether you have a 4G smartphone or not, uh, and then where you are politically, where you are geographically, what your gender is, what your income might be, who your friends are. Is that good? <laughs> you know, I don't necessarily know if it's good because it doesn't make the candidate have to work for most of their votes. I mean, it, it's certainly efficient for the campaigns because they can say, I really want to narrowly target the swing voter. I want to get that person across the bubble onto my side. But it seems like similar to how most of the country gets short shrift in the national campaign because you're probably already a red or a blue state unless you're one of six states in the country, right? So all of the ad dollars go to those six states. And frankly, I'm pretty happy that I don't have to see those political ads. But there's, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, uh, a line of thought that says, well, why don't we just have this entire election come down to Florida and Ohio and let them just go campaign there for the rest of the year and you know, spare the rest of us? 
Um, uh, I, I don't know if anybody but the broadcasters would be happy because they'd be, you know, sitting in Fat City with lots of ad money. But we lost that swing state. That we were the bellwether state for a yeah. long time, and we've yeah. been. Uh, we've kind of been, uh, even so we have a debate coming up here in St. Louis. Yeah. I don't know that that, that has more to do with the, the track record of Washington University hosting debates. I don't think it has much to do with our uh, swing state uh, status well, but, anymore. And also these debates are going to be watched by, you know, I mean, I, I think the first debate might be yeah. not quite Super Bowl size, but it's going to be a very significant audience. I mean, even the, the previous foreign policy town halls that Matt Lauer hosted had, you know, very good numbers. What are you expecting for these debates? Because it seems like a lot of, I have no a idea. big unknown. Yeah, it is a huge unknown. Known. And I, you know, uh, na uh, the night of one of the debates, I'm going to be hosting kind of a pre-debate party, uh, and we're going to be talking about Frontline's uh, uh, program called The Choice, which I've had the privilege to take a sneak peek at. It is fantastic television. I, you know, set your DVR. Uh, I want to say it's September 26th or 27th. I can't remember which day, but it's two hours, and it's this amazing look at both these candidates in a way that you actually haven't seen yet. Uh, and it's not looking at the day-to-day -day stuff that we see flying past. I mean, it goes all the way back into their childhoods. It starts to give you, by the end of these two hours, you say, well, based on what I've learned about what the formula is that both of these people have created as their winning formula, as their path to success, of course they're doing the things that they're doing. It's almost, when I saw it and afterwards, two other things happened in the campaign, and as soon as I looked at it and said, well, of course he's doing that and of course she's doing this because this is what they've done for 25 years in all kinds of other situations. More of that context that you're talking yeah. about that you can get. Yeah. Um, we're in St. Louis. Race is a big topic in the country right now. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the, the, the topic might be whether or not we want to deal with race in this country. But we, you know, we're not too far from where a lot of this conversation started yeah. in 2014. What, what do you see? Are you hopeful on that front when it comes to issues in this country? You know, a lot of times uh, you get the sort of lip service that this should be part of a national conversation. Guess what? That's exactly what's happening, right? So if you imagine that this is a conversation that perhaps Ferguson helped start but has continued for the last two or three years, an unfortunate incident after incident that's been revealed on video, uh, all the way to maybe even uh, uh, Colin Kaepernick and the, and the athletes that are uh, kneeling with him right now. This is the conversation. These are the ways that people are having a dialogue about a topic that is really difficult for people to sit down and talk about. So if it's uh, a police video or if it's an athlete that gets a couple of people to sit next to each other and say, well, I see it totally different. Well, that's great. It's an opening and it's an opportunity. It's long overdue and it's I mean, I think this is the difficult stuff that actually brings us closer together. And it's the opportunity for you to see somebody else's point of view and say, all right, you know, we've been friends for a long time. We're, we're thinking differently about this. I respect this person. How, how could they see this same set of facts so differently for me? Okay, I get it. You know, and that's all you really need is just to be able to respect another person's idea when it's different from you. And that's something, a lot, a lot of times, I think, conversation about conversations about race just get very inflamed very quickly and people just kind of talk right past each other. Where oftentimes there's actually a pretty big amount of middle ground that they agree on, a sense of justice and a sense of, uh, you know, a, a kind of moral rectitude. But it's really along the margins that the tensions get much more inflamed. Um, and I think that most people want the, the, the sort of the same set of ideals in an America about equality and justice for all. Um, that our founders wanted. It's just that somewhere along the way that there have been significant sidetracks that have had some long-term consequences. And, and a lot of us weren't around for other big moments in history when yeah. dealing with this, and we kind of have this view that, wow, it was so much more tame, or everything was so much yeah. easier then. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm sure it was just as difficult, or if not infinitely more difficult. Right, it's just that we're not, we're not seeing it on Twitter, right? We're not seeing... The, I mean, imagine if the people who sat at those lunch counters had these kind of organizing tools. Um, and, you know, and I also, as, as, as tech happy and savvy as I am, I also say, you know, a, a cautionary note to some young people and say, listen, just because you retweeted it doesn't mean you actually got something done. Because look at what it took for those people in the civil rights movement to, you know, what did they endure? to go physically be someplace in real life, not in virtual space, to stand for something. And that 
that took something. And that's a generation of people who made some significant sacrifices. And so what are the sacrifices that we're willing to make to cultivate the kind of next vision for America? We have about two minutes left. You're a TV guy. We have exactly a minute 30 left. Okay. Uh, between now and November, what are you what are you focusing on? What are you looking at? What is your where is your lens going to be pointed for the news hour on the weekend? So uh, the news hour on the weekend, we have a few election focused pieces uh, coming up, but not necessarily again trying to look at these things through a different lens. Perhaps it's an issue. Uh, it's not necessarily just about a candidate. Um, and then we also have uh, for I mean news hour weekday has the benefit of. Gwen Ifill and Judy Woodruff, who are two of the smartest people, smartest women, leaders, uh, colleagues. I'm proud to call them my, you know, kind of the leadership in, in that organization. They're some of the smartest women and the smartest people in Washington about this, and they have a very good meter on, is this important and is this newsworthy tonight or not? So I think we're in good hands on the weekday and on the weekend on, on figuring out how to measure this out and also how to keep the rest of, how to keep folks informed about what else is going on. We'll be watching Hari Srinivasan from PBS, senior correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, and then the anchor of PBS NewsHour Weekend. Thank it's, you. It's only a half hour on the weekend, though. Is that right? Or is this... That's right, but two half hours make an hour. Okay, very good. <laughs> Hari, thanks for being in St. Louis. Thanks for talking Thank to you. us. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for Thank having you me. so much. Thanks for watching.